<laughs> Thank you. Gracias. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, and thanks all of you for that really warm welcome. I'm so pleased to be here this evening among students, among colleagues, among dear friends in the community. I have to say I'm kind of blown away by seeing people who over the years have connected with me with Cuba in some way. So a warm welcome to all of you. And a warm welcome too to, our, to those participating online, um, friends in a variety of countries and also members of my family in several states. I have a very large family. And so um, thanks for being part of this very special evening. When I have come back from Cuba many times over almost 30 years now, I've almost always been asked the same two questions. I'm going to start my remarks tonight with the first question, and then toward the end of the talk, I'll get to that second question. The first question, Anne-Marie, do you have any cigars? <laughs> um, I actually do have some cigars, and I was suggesting that maybe I could leave one on each seat as kind of a little door prize for each of you, but I was dissuaded from that. Apparently, there's this fire marshal thing, or anyway, that wasn't going to work out. What do we think of when we think of Cuba? We think of remix and revolution. We think of Brian coming to the rescue. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. No. think of Cuba, what comes to mind immediately are cigars, old cars, <laughs> colorful cocktails. Can anyone recognize this particular version? <laughs> Mojito, you're right. Okay. Our images of Cuba are stereotypes for the most part. Many of us have not had the opportunity to be there. So when we think of Cuba, we think of two-dimensional characters in predictable plots. We think of bombshells, often with maracas, or we think of bearded revolutionaries. These stereotypes persist. They stick in our heads the way this fruit basket sticks on the head of Carmen Miranda, no matter how much twirling and whirling she seems to do. Cuba remains an enigma. Most of us in the U.S. don't know much about the country, only 90 miles off the shores of Florida. The politics and practices of both governments have resulted in keeping us apart, have resulted in keeping people in the U.S. and Cuba in the dark about one another for more than a half century. We tend, as a result, to envision the island of Cuba as stuck in time, as a place that's not changing, as a place that's static, frozen, if you will. For the past three decades, I've been exploring a different image of the island. I've been looking at the ways in which Cubans imagine their own world through cinema. And this evening, I want to take you on location in Cuba to share some highlights. I want to talk about how Cuban filmmakers depict their changing island. And I want to give you a sense of how William and Mary connects with Cuba's culture and people through my work, but also through the work of other colleagues and certainly through the work of students. What you will see is a remix of creativity, 
collaboration, and connectedness. Revolutionary cinema in Cuba dates back to the very beginning, to 1959, 1960, when in the second decree of the new government, a film institute was established. This is a time in Cuba where supporters of the revolution were celebrating the triumph, the euphoria, and detractors of the revolution were experiencing loss and disillusionment. But it was a time when culture was going to be at the very center of creating this new identity. For people not familiar with Cuba, it's striking to see how central culture is in the country, how central culture is on the island. I recall an, an experience from 2002 when I was part of a delegation um, consulting with the Center for Defense Information. And our task was to help the US Coast Guard and their counterparts in Cuba <clears throat> team up to um, intervene in potential terrorist threats and drug trafficking. We had a very successful week of conversations, made a great deal of progress, and as a result, we got invited by Fidel Castro to the presidential palace for dinner. We were milling around and discussing our work of the week, uh, talking about world events, but the conversation came back time and time again to culture, to art, to theater, to dance, and to film. And not just to Cuba's culture, it was to worldwide culture. The conversation came back to uh, Disney films as well as Japanese anime. We talked about British pop music as well as border crossing hip hop. Culture was everywhere present that evening. And I think my US um, Companions were very surprised by that. So that's something I would like to emphasize for us here this evening. Culture is at the very center from the beginning of the revolution. Within the realm of culture, cinema was deemed to be the mode through which revolutionary ideals would be disseminated, um, through which the Cuban people would be educated and a principal mode of entertainment as well. Through film, notions of citizenship would be defined, relationships to the state would be negotiated, and alliances would be forged. For the past half century then, in Cuba, film has been an arbiter of identity. One Cuban writer, Senel Paz, has said, of the 1960s, I remember that during those years, I went to the cinema not to see films, but to become Cuban. He, like so many other Cubans, went to the movies to learn how to be Cuban. What images and sounds would be selected to portray and indeed create this emerging cinema culture? How would an authentic film language be forged? The filmmakers experimented. And for the most part, they succeeded, as evidenced by the quality and quantity of the output from those early years. Cuban films, and here I'm speaking of all kinds of films, newsreels, documentaries, animation, feature films, they captivated, they, sorry, they captured the turbulent 1960s on the island and around the world. Films about literacy achievements in Cuba, films about the trauma of race riots in the US, films about the euphoria over man stepping onto the moon. These films impressed audiences at home and abroad. Some works from 1960s Cuba are still deemed to be extraordinary accomplishments. The film Memories of Underdevelopment, for example, consistently makes its way onto the list of the world's 100 best films of all time. And the short documentary by Santiago Alvarez, Now, 
is deemed to be one of the precursors of the music video, if not the precursor. Cubans, of course, would say it's the precursor. <clears throat> They're very proud of their national cinema. Some film projects went unmade because the subject matter or genre or treatment was incompatible with the state's priorities and political agendas of the time. In fact, right now in the Botetot Gallery in SWEM Library, there's a student curated exhibit of posters that feature these ghost films or films that were never made in Cuba. I'll talk a bit more about this later, but know that you're invited to stop by and take a look at that. So I mentioned that some films went unmade. <clears throat> Excuse me. Other films that were made did not circulate widely, or even at all. On occasion, a filmmaker who felt his creativity was stifled left the island for good. Overall, however, for 30 years, Cuba's National Film Institute, the ICAIC, served as the engine driving the creation of remarkable films and their widespread circulation. Cuba's industry was a model for other nations and regions looking to develop a vibrant film tradition. Cuba inspired the new Latin American cinema movement, for example, and also the third cinema movement. Cuba was also important as a festival center. The International Festival of New Latin American Cinema, held each December in Havana, has been and continues to be a hub for film in the Americas. And Cuba's fanatical film goers were the envy of directors and cinema owners around the world. It's unbelievable, during the festival, Cubans will save up vacation all year so as to take it during the entire duration of this two-week festival, and they'll think nothing of seeing four films a day. And then came 1989. A pivotal year in many parts of the world with the breakup of the Soviet Union, the dismantling of the Berlin Wall, and the ending of the Cold War. But to say that this was a pivotal year in Cuba, a pivotal moment, would be a gross understatement. It was devastating. The loss of its ally and major trading partner left the small island nation floundering. What resulted was a severe economic crisis, shortages of everything, even the most basic goods like food, and widespread uncertainty. What was becoming of Cuba? What would it mean to be Cuban in moving forward? During the summer of 1994, some of you may recall the Balsero crisis when some 35,000 Cubans floated away from the island on makeshift rafts, some to wash up on the shores of Florida and others to be engulfed by the sea. It was the special period. I recall experiences from those years. I was going to Cuba on research trips during the special period. I recall meeting with my mentor, one of Cuba's leading intellectuals, Ambrosio Fornet, and he was writing an essay, and he was using the margin, not even the backside, because both sides of the page had already been used. He was writing in the margin of a previously used sheet of paper, and he joked that in Cuba, paperback writer meant something else. Incredible how Cubans retained their sense of humor um, during this really difficult time. I remember going to a theater with uh, the director of a play that was being staged. And we walked into this dark venue. We got there early. And he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a light bulb. And he screwed it into the socket. And he explained that light bulbs were so scarce and that he only had this one for the theater, he didn't dare to leave it um, and risk it being lost. Most grueling of all, though, the most difficult memories have to do with going to the homes of my friends at the time 
seeing the conditions in which they were living. I remember a friend who was sharing what he didn't have. He invited me for a meal, and he opened the refrigerator, and there I saw a pitcher of water and some grapefruit rinds. These rinds were breaded and fried, and they, they were considered steak um, at the time. So a time of uncertainty, a time of dislocation, a time of darkness. It was during this time that the filmmaker Fernando Perez was working on a project titled Madagascar. He recalls that time and he says every day he worked on the film and every day he did so thinking it would be the last day he'd ever be a filmmaker. He said he was concerned that there wouldn't be food to feed the crew, that there wouldn't be gasoline to move the equipment, that there wouldn't be electricity to charge the batteries that were needed to operate the cameras. It was a very difficult time in Cuba, one that almost no one thought Cubans would emerge from. Let's take a look at a clip of Fernando Perez's film, Madagascar, to get a feel for this dark, bleak time. You'll note his reliance on tones of blues and grays. That's simply the tone of the time. Pero se pasa todo el día así, ensimismada, mirando quién sabe a dónde y sin decir una sola palabra. Hasta físicamente ha cambiado. Solo le importan sus dos ratones. Yo también tuve ratones, pero no fue para tanto. ¿Y tú no piensas desempacar tus cosas? Vas a convertirte en una gitana. Me voy de viaje. Me voy de viaje para Madagascar. ¿Para dónde? Para Madagascar. Pero qué locura es esa, Laurita. ¿Tú sabes la estupidez que tú estás diciendo? No es una estupidez. Es lo que no conozco. Cuba survived this crisis against all odds. How did it manage to do so? By expanding its tourist infrastructure and attracting visitors from around the world, by seeking and securing foreign investment through joint ventures, by tolerating and even encouraging private enterprise. This was the time of the creation of family-run restaurants, bed and breakfasts, uh, farmers markets, craft stands, bicycle taxis, and by forging new partnerships, bringing non-governmental organizations onto the island and collaborating with partners in other countries. So Cuba survived by changing by adapting, by connecting. This island was anything but frozen in time. As you might imagine, the film world changed dramatically too. Some of the changes had to do with the special period and circumstances in Cuba. Other changes had to do with the changing landscape of film worldwide. I documented this moment in Cuba's film world in my book devoted to street filmmaking, a time of transition when, film work, when filmmakers worked between the state-supported industry and the growing private sector, between industry and indie. During this time, co-production came to replace state financing. New themes were tackled and new genres employed. New partnerships were developed, 
with these new non-governmental organizations, with state organizations on the island, and with partners in other countries, and emerging technologies were embraced. It was during this time that 35 millimeter gave way to analog video and then digital, and truckloads of heavy equipment um, began to be replaced by lightweight cameras and small crews. As a result, a new generation of very agile, very talented filmmakers emerged. They shared a desire to experiment and a knack for innovation. What they didn't have, they invented. The word of the day for these filmmakers was resolver, make do, make it happen, just make it work. So you don't have any transportation for your project? Grab your bicycle and pedal around Havana. No dolly? Borrow a TV cart or maybe even a wheelchair. No light reflectors? How about a sofa cushion? Um, these are all examples that filmmakers shared with me during interviews. So these are fixes that they actually used. No money to pay professionals? Gather your family and friends. And that's just what Juan Carlos Cremata did. Juan Carlos Cremata was thinking about a major feature film that required a large budget. He pitched that project to the Film Institute and it was turned down. So rather than sacrifice his idea for the film to do a low budget version, which he didn't think would be possible, rather than just walk away uh, disgruntled, he got to work on another project. And what he did was created the idea for a road movie that would involve two 11-year-old children who run away from home and cross the island of Cuba. He titled this Viva Cuba. He had a very low budget, and so he had to think about ways to do things on the cheap. One of the ways he did this was to engage his entire family, and fortunately, he comes from a very talented family. So his mother produced the film, his cousin composed the music, his brother, who leads a theater troupe, trained the two selected and trained the two child actors. And can you guess who played the grandmother? His abuelita played the grandmother in the film. He also had a very talented crew, people who were adept at making fixes on the fly. I spoke with his camera operator, Alejandro Perez, and he was telling me about some of the ways he was able to resolver he was able to make do. So for example, in one sequence, he had envisioned, or the director had envisioned, the two children running through the woods. Well, to get that shot, he would have liked to have had um, a dolly, laid tracks, and then moved that piece of equipment to follow the children. Didn't have that, didn't have the money to rent it, even if it had been available, didn't have the time to add another day to the production in order to make that happen. So what did he do? He drew a circle by the woods, in a clearing in the woods. He had the children run around that circle. He put a pole in the middle, hung a camera on it, spun the pole, and got the shot he needed. And that's the shot we're gonna take a look at right now. What you'll notice is the ways in which the uh, clearing in the woods repeats at regular <laughs> intervals. <laughs> Ingenuity. 
This film was very successful. It's been shown at film festivals in many countries. In fact, we just showed it here last semester as part of an international independent film series in the Bada Tot Auditorium, so I think some of you here actually would have seen that. And it positioned the filmmaker to go on and do his next work. Juan Carlos Cremata is one of the Cuban filmmakers who has visited us here at William & Mary. He was the first Cuban filmmaker I invited and came to the college back in 1994. My um, former colleague Jim Griffin will recall us hosting Juan Carlos Cremata back in the day. It was quite wonderful. There are other filmmakers who have come to William & Mary. I want to mention just a few of them by way of wrapping up the first part of this presentation in order to show the, the variety of the themes they work with, the range of stories they're interested in, and also the tendency right now among Cuban filmmakers to be widely connected, to be dealing with multiple traditions. So, if we have a notion of Cuba as completely isolated, I think the experiences and examples of these filmmakers will invite us to rethink that. Esteban Insausti has just um, begun work on a film called Jazz Club. This is going to be a feature-length film that deals with the stories of three accomplished jazz musicians as they make their way um, during the heyday of jazz between Havana and New York. In the center of the slide, you'll see the actress Sulema Clares, very talented Cuban actress who works sometimes in theater in New York and sometimes in film projects in Cuba. Oneda Gonzalez and Gustavo Perez are at work on a documentary about the poet named Severo Sardui. Severo Sardui was born in Cuba, grew up in the town of Camagüey, left for Paris in his 20s, and never returned. So in some ways, he's one of these poets without a nation. He doesn't completely belong to Cuba, nor does he completely belong to France. Oneda and Gustavo are devoting their documentary to his life, and in order to do that, they've filmed interviews in Paris, in Havana, Camagüey, Princeton, New Jersey, and Miami. Alfredo Ureta has just completed a documentary about a group of Cuban baseball players, a young team that went to Florida, the first baseball players, little league baseball players, to travel from Cuba to Florida in something like, um, since the 1940s, I believe. And his documentary shares the experience of that competition as well as their delight at going to Disney and getting to a major league ballpark. Right now, he's working on getting financing for a feature film and get this, it's going to be a thriller. It's called Infiltrated Paradise, and it's about US tourists in Cuba. <laughs> so um, he's looking for investors. If any of you are feeling entrepreneurial, I'm happy to pass along some contact information. Carlos Rodriguez, a friend. Um, there's a group of students here you'll hear, hear more about. We just spent a week in Cuba over spring break, and Carlos Rodriguez was one of the Cubans who helped host us. He's working on a documentary that's very personal. It's called Rodriguez versus Rodriguez, and it's about his mother and his father. His mother is a heroine of the Cuban Revolution. His father is a detractor. His father left the country when Carlos was a baby. Carlos has no memory of his father in his life when he was growing up. With this film project, he's bringing their stories together. He's also reuniting them 
um, in real life. They will, his plan is to bring them together. So again, border crossing stories. So I mentioned these filmmakers have been to William and Mary, and what I want to do is give a bit more information about some of the ways William and Mary has connected with Cuba and with Cuba's culture. In order to begin to talk about connecting William and Mary and Cuba in terms of this film work, I need to remember, sorry, I need to take us back for a moment to 1993. It was the time of Cuba's special period, as I mentioned, a time of uncertainty that Fernando Perez was documenting in Madagascar. And it was a time when I had just taken a position at the college. I received a phone call, and it was a call from Cuba. It was a call from Fernando Perez. And he said, Ana Maria, I just learned that my eldest child, my only son, has decided to emigrate. He's leaving me and moving to the US. My heart is breaking. The only way I can bear this is if I know he goes into good hands, if he goes to a good home. And I think I had my response out before he even asked the question. He said, could you take him? Claro que sí, Fernando. Por, su, por supuesto que sí. Fran Ernesto, named after Ernesto Che Guevara, came to the U.S. He arrived in Newport News with his very small carry-on, with his worldly possessions, and in that very small carry-on was a little ceramic coffee set that he brought. And Fran lived with my husband David and me for the next three years while he learned English. He earned his degree. He worked two jobs, and he became encaminado. He forged his path into the future. As you might imagine, that was a powerful experience for me. That was a privilege. And it was instrumental as I was forging my path as a professional here at the college. It became clear that my journey would involve fostering creativity, engendering collaboration, and forging connections. It would be a path on which I experimented with what it meant to teach with research and to empower students as scholars. And it was a path that would keep me connected with Cuba. With that, I'd like to turn to a few highlights from along the way. Part of the work I've done has had to do with documenting what's going on in Cuba's film world and that, of course, has been a window into the larger world on the island. What you'll see here is a, a short video that um, captures images. Troy Davis, a colleague in SWEM Library, the director of media services, and I um, filmed. We were on location with Alfredo Ureta as he was making a feature film. He generously invited us in, allowed us to move around, um, and our challenge was to stay out of his shot, particularly, as you'll notice, when we're in a very tiny bathroom with a lot of people. So this will give you a sense of what it feels like, what it looks like to be doing film research some of the time. Yo soy un hombre sincero. ¿De dónde crece la palma? Antes de morir yo quiero echar mi verso de la. Cuando la mira, cuando la mira. 
Mira, Guantanamera. ¿Listos? Listo. Corre sonido. Corre. Corre cámara. Corre cámara. Secuencia 42-1-1. Acción. joined us at William and Mary. We have film directors, but we also have an editor, a producer, a special effects um, technician, and a designer. So it's a way for William and Mary students to connect with a whole range of individuals involved in creating and circulating films. This material then can be used um, for research purpose purposes. So for example, to put into the next book. It can also be used by students for remixing and creating their own media projects. We share this material in community presentations, campus and community presentations. Um, we also invite filmmakers for that same purpose, and students often participate in organizing those events, in introducing our guests, and in sharing information about their work. The impact of inviting these filmmakers obviously um, benefits us, but the filmmakers say it's also really important for them. In most cases, their visit to William and Mary was their first visit to the US. So they came directly from Cuba, um, made their way to Williamsburg, and from here then they're able to develop more contacts and get a better sense of this country. So I feel as though we've been important ambassadors for them. While these filmmakers are at William and Mary, we also always interview them. Students, again, participate in the process. They study the work of these filmmakers ahead of time. They prepare the interview questions, ask them, film the interview, edit it, um, and later promote it. 
Some of these projects have been disseminated quite widely in presentations at conferences and even as works at film festivals. This material also is useful in publishing. This image is of a faculty, librarian, student collaboration. I edited a volume, World Film Locations, Havana, and it involves contributors from six different countries. So from Cuba, certainly, and the US, but also from Wales, from Canada, from Spain, and I believe it's from Australia. And it's wonderful that in addition to that international mix, we have a, a campus collaboration and we have a student who's now published in there, Emma Rodbin. Another way that we connect with Cuban filmmakers and with Cuba's cinema tradition is through subtitling. Early on when I was teaching film here at the college and looking to get films from Latin America in general and from Cuba in particular, it was really difficult to get high quality copies. It wasn't that they were widely distributed, you know, it, it was maybe making a copy from someone else's copy, it would be going to these film festivals, bringing back VHS tapes. Um, in any case, I thought for many years, gosh, I wish someone would just take it upon themselves to pull this material together, subtitle it, and package it up for U.S. universities. And I'm ashamed to say how many years I thought that before I actually took the initiative, met with the Film Institute and said, what would you think about this idea? And they said, we think it's brilliant. Go for it. So they opened their archives to me. I had the opportunity to screen um, a whole range of documentaries, select what I wanted to work with for thematic volumes in this DVD series called Cuban Cinema Classics. And my students have worked with me on that. We've worked in the Reader Media Center to translate, to subtitle, and I'm pleased to say that many of my colleagues in uh, modern languages and literatures and in film and media studies are also working in this way connecting our institution with filmmakers worldwide. Let's take a look at what um, we see when we think about a subtitling workshop at William & Mary. This video is a student-created project. Es una aventura aquí, y cada día está lleno de sorpresa. No quiero volver a dormir en Cuba. E incluso, después de que he vuelto a casa, y el lugar ha desaparecido por completo de la vista, me parece que me persigue, como una rumba distante.
Wow. <clears throat> they are something, aren't they? I would like to invite the participants in the New Media Workshop, Curate, Connect, Cuba, to stand up. And let's just give them one more applause. They have agreed to stick around for the reception. They have agreed to wear their orange t-shirts. I can't believe I made them do that, but they're so, um, they, they get the solidarity thing. They said, yes, we'll, we'll do that for you. So feel free to seek them out after this talk and speak with them about their experiences. We see here we're one member of our group on the right, David Culver, an alumnus. And this is kind of an interesting development. Um, study abroad, if you will. This idea for the trip actually was inspired by the new CALL curriculum. CALL 300 is a course that has at its core connecting with cultures that are unfamiliar. And so we decided to add this spring break trip to Cuba as part of our um, workshop. And David Culver, a student who was in the very first New Media workshop several years back, signed on to join us as an alumnus. He's now a reporter and anchor for NBC4 in Washington, DC. So current students had an opportunity to spend time with this alumnus, pick his brain, learn from him. Um, and David is becoming one of the people at NBC who goes to Cuba regularly to cover events there. This is both of us in Havana in August, just this past August, when we went together for the flag raising at the US Embassy in Havana. It was an amazing full circle moment for me because here was a student who had been in this new media workshop, who had learned about Cuba, who had gotten his hands dirty working with film, with media. He's now a reporter anchor and he called me and said, Anne Marie, any chance you'd want to join NBC and me to cover the events in Cuba, and I said, well, twist my arm. He said, well, I'd need you to field produce. I'd need you to help share contacts, people I could, you know, feature. He said, and I, and I said, I absolutely count me in. And he said, and I'd need you to be on camera, live. And I thought, oh, this isn't really, yes, of course I'll do it. So I did it. Um, it was a new experience for me, but I think what's beautiful is this full circle of William and Mary students moving out into the world, remaining connected with other students who are still on their journey. Connections, connectedness, one of the underlying themes of my work with Cuba, with um, all of our work at William & Mary is establishing relationships, establishing connections. That can only happen with <laughs> partnerships. So many of you in this room have done your part to help move us forward as an institution to help inspire learning at William & Mary. It will be impossible for me to thank each of you, but know that I'm really grateful for everything you all have done and continue to do with us and for us. And given that some of these people are in the audience, I can't resist just running down the list with a few names. So this, I'll first say, this was a wonderful group of lifelong learners. Um, William and Mary alumni for the, the most part who accompanied me to Cuba on a study trip. 
Sue Girdleman, Linda Montgomery, skipping over me, we have Martha Tack, Karen Cottrell, Kathy Hornsby, and Nancy Matthews. And there are other partners in crime, travelers in crime, out here in the audience. So um, thanks to all of you for remaining connected to William & Mary. Thanks to all of you for what you do for this institution. And I now have to get back to that second question that I told you I would conclude with. When is Cuba going to open up? I've been asked that question so many times, and I think what the speaker generally means is, when will the US and Cuba change the nature of the relationship? I'm so enthused to be able to say this is happening. Seeing President Obama, the Pope, Tampa Bay baseball players, the Rolling Stones, hearing from my friends in Cuba um, about these events and hearing, reading the media about these events, it's a very energizing time. I'm very heartened by the possibilities. I've experienced firsthand the power of education and culture to bring the people of our countries together. I've witnessed and have been humbled by the ability of William and Mary students to connect with Cubans, with the people of Cuba, whether on our campus or on the island, sometimes in really surprising ways. This slide is an image of the poet on the right, Delphine Prats, and the hand of a student. And this student was one who went on the trip without knowing any Spanish, but she was very interested in being there. She grew up speaking a bit of Russian, and she and this poet, who doesn't speak any English, managed to find common ground. They managed to realize that they shared a language in common, and they continue to be in touch. I'm humbled and inspired by that kind of connection. And I continue to benefit from the support and affirmation and interest of so many. Please know how grateful I am. Gracias. You guys. <laughs>